thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. I'm, I'm very excited to be speaking about RegTech with a, a fantastic panel today. And um, I'll start off by giving a short introduction of uh, my esteemed panelists, but I'd recommend please have a look at their, their bios. We have an excellent panel today. Uh, this is going to be a very short introduction, but immediately uh, to my left is uh, Gordon Chappell. He is the uh, RegTech manager at the FCA. And he's responsible for managing the team that uh, delivers the FCA's RegTech strategy, which is part of the regulator's RegTech and advanced analytics department. Uh, next to him is Chiwa Cartwright. And she is a senior specialist for Innovation Hub at the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. And she leads coordination between uh, that agency and FinTech and regulatory uh, RegTech enterprises. And she also develops policy advice there. Um, next to her is uh, Joanne Barefoot. And she is a founder and CEO of Barefoot Innovation Group and co-founder of Hummingbird RegTech. Um, she's also a senior uh, fellow emerita at Harvard Kennedy School for Center for Business and Government. And she is also on a, a host of uh, RegTech boards and committees. And then next to her is, uh, uh, is the governor of the Central Bank of Bahrain, uh, Rashid al Maraj, And uh, that's a role that he's held since 2005. Um, in addition to monetary policy, the central bank um, also is the regulator for Bahrain's uh, financial services industry. And so, yeah, I'd love to go into talking a little bit about RegTech today, which is obviously it's a, it's, it's a wide category, just like FinTech itself. And there's, just like FinTech, there's, there's hype, but there's also a lot of promise. And today we have a fantastic panel to help sort through the overpromises and also find out what might actually get delivered. And we have a very international... Um, uh, group here, so I thought we could start off by just kind of taking a look internationally, looking at your regions, if you will, on, on what is happening there. I wanted to say, you know, what, is, what are you seeing in your region? And I thought we'd start at, at the end of the panel. I'd start with the governor. You know, what kind of reg tech innovation are you seeing in your region? What's, what's being developed there? Well, I must admit, you know, the, this is a very new thing for us. You know, we in Bahrain started... Uh, putting the fintech industry under the umbrella of the central bank only two years ago. Uh, we started by uh, the regulatory sandbox first. And uh, up till now, we have almost 30 co uh, companies from different parts of the world in different uh, domain of the fintech space. Uh, obviously, the, the rapid changes within this industry is taking us by surprise, as, as regulators. But what matters for me uh, is that to put the right ecosystem in place. Um, I know there are a lot of things that the regulators themselves might not be very much aware of it. But I think our role now, as I see it from my position, is to inspire and lead and remove any roadblocks. Uh, you know, as a regulator, traditionally, we act like police. Mm -hmm. We don't like to take risk. We, before we authorize any uh, services, we usually try to measure and understand the risks. So FinTech took us by surprise. And if we keep our the same mindset. I think it is not going to be something useful for the industry and the, for the economy. So the first thing I did, I tried to change my own mindset. I tried to remove this policeman hat. I call it now Basel hat. <laughs> and think like an entrepreneur. What are the things that will make the regulator friendly to a new startups, how we are going to encourage the banks and convince them that all these new things are going to be uh, useful for them, useful for their customers, and for the economy at large. I think that was the main thing that I spent my time over the last two years, changing the mindset within the institutions and leading the, uh, the industry. I, I know that uh, the industry uh, at the beginning 
were very hesitant. The banks did not like the central bank to license non-bank institutions to offer financial services. Uh, but we had to take that initiative. For the RegTag, I think uh, anything that will facilitate the communication and the better understanding between the, re the licensees and the regulator is a good thing with our artificial intelligence and, and so on. But I think the most important thing for us as a regulator, beside you know, trying to be a good cop, is have a quality assessment of the risk. The numbers that you provide for the regulators is OK. And everybody can tick the box. But I think the role of the regulator at the end of the day is to have a qualitative assessment of all of this. How do you read these numbers and make sure that this num the numbers that provided by the, by, uh, and the data that comes from the licensees, you are in a position to really assess it in a, in a, in a meaningful way, a way that will maintain financial stability and reduce the risk within the system. While also making sure that you're encouraging innovation, you don't want rules that, that snuff that out. Um, yeah. and, and Joanne, you know, I, you're you're based in the U.S., but I know you spend a lot of time traveling, a lot of time on on flights. What are what are you seeing, perhaps in the U.S. or elsewhere? So it's wonderful to be here and see this turnout for this topic. I like to remind people that we go to these conferences and we see all these wonderful fintech innovations, and none of them are going to reach their full promise unless we get the regulation right. And so that's what we're talking about here. And I think that this year is a turning point for the regulators themselves in embracing technology and reg tech in particular, not just how to regulate fintech, but how to use regulation, or use technology and encourage the industry to use it for compliance. I have to say, as I always do, the FCA leads on this. People here probably know this, but maybe don't fully appreciate it. The FCA was years ahead of the other uh, <coughs> countries with a few partial exceptions in creating a reg tech group. And they've now, I know you just had Nick Cook on the stage. He is now heading an elevated, much, much larger innovation group, the largest in the world, I'm pretty sure. And um, so that's all very exciting. And you see the change going on everywhere. In North America, Canada and Mexico both have lots of uh, interesting reg tech initiatives on. But I do want to mention the United States. We have tended to be a little behind the curve in the US, partly because, as some of you know, we have a lot of regulatory agencies in the United States. I used to be a deputy controller of the currency. That's one of them. Uh, and so it's been a little harder to get organized and figure out who should take the lead. But that has really changed. We had a very important report come out last year from our Treasury Department, strongly encouraging interagency coordination and FinTech and RegTech. And we have two uh, agency heads right now in the United States who have really elevated this issue. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission chairman, I, ha I will tell you, I have a podcast show, Barefoot Innovation, on these topics. And I have a program coming out with him, Chris. And Carlo, which is unlike any regulatory conversation I've ever had before, really a vision for turning them into a quantitative regulator, bringing in the data science people, just totally transforming what they do. And the other one I just would like to mention uh, is that we have a new chairman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, whose name is Yalana McWilliams. And she is a completely disruptive, visionary leader. I've been involved in US regulation for a long time. I, we have never had a, a regulator agency head like her. She has set out to, this is her word, transform how they regulate banks during her five-year term. So keep your eye on that. She's launching a big initiative. Nick Cook was with us in the States a few days ago, speaking to the FDIC's conference. There's just a whole new conversation underway. And at the heart of it is uh, the regulators thinking about how to digitize, how to move from the analog to the digital age and use data and analytics in new ways that will transform how we do all of this. 
In Chihuahua, what are you seeing, either whether it's in Australia or perhaps things you've seen on your travels or in your research? What, or what, what kinds of things have caught your eye? Yep, sure. John, first of all, thank you so much for saying my name perfectly. <laughs> I normally just I've been get practicing all day. <laughs> I normally just get calls to say, hi, Dale, or Mrs. Cartwright. <laughs> but um, yes, when it comes to Australia, Australia's red tech industry have uh, expanded significantly in the last two years. And in fact, based on some of the research, we have uh, we are now the, the third largest um, country in the world mm -hmm. with the red tech startups just behind the UK and the US. So uh, it may be a little bit confronting say in front of you, but Australia does believe that we have the ability to be a world leader in, in the red tech space. Um, so using technology to um, assist the development uh, is not new. In terms of the financial service, we have seen, red, um, we have seen technology being used in capital allocations, credit assessments, and so on. But now I think it comes to the stage that technology companies believe that they can play a critical role in terms of a regulatory compliance. Um, that, that just comes in naturally with the tons of regulations that have been released based on some research. There is a new regulatory alert issue every six minutes. So technology <coughs> companies believe they have a, a vital role to play. And financial in institutions are also looking to red tech for, for solutions. Um, when it comes to Australia, I think um, some of you may be following the news that we recently have the Royal Commission inquiry into banking and superannuation and so on. So the, the, um, the banking inquiry certainly have highlighted some of the misconducts and also the importance of uh, trust and also highlight some of, the, um, um, some of the problems that may be caused by um, insufficient risk management and also bad culture. Um, so with the new the environment, definitely uh, red tech companies see they can play a, a vital role in that. And when it comes to the, our perspective as a regulator, we are very keenly interested in this space. We have set up our innovation hub that to engage with the red tech com uh, communities and also the fintech communities. So when it comes to red tech ethic as a, the, the financial regulator, we see our road one hand as a consumer of the reg regulatory technology. On the other hand, we also see ourselves as a promoter and facilitator um, for the adoption of uh, red tax. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm. Well, and we've spoken about the FCA and UK regulation a little bit, but I, I wondered what sort of you know, regulatory technology developments are you seeing here in the UK? What has caught your eye there? Um, quite a few, actually. I mean, it's a pretty interesting place. I suppose the one thing I would add to what colleagues have said is that I think because certainly we don't regulate the reg tech firms, um, it provides an ability for regulators to learn and actually to share that information rather than um, all learn about a particular technology individually. Mm. So I think there's, a, that there's something that's quite unique about reg tech firms um, and certainly one of the things that from the FCA we're really keen to do and, and have done is open up a number of you know, relationships with other colleague regulators so that we can actually share mm. some of the learnings. And so if I think about one of the simplest ones um, that we're involved in, we're trying, we have a, a duty to understand, um, or we, we try and ensure that financial promotions in the UK are fair, clear and transparent. Um, and you know, you can get a person to go through the creative copy of all of these and make an assessment, that will take hours. Um, so one of the things we're looking at is how can we use web scraping and other forms of technology to actually understand whether the text, the visuals, and other aspects of the creative copy are likely to be more risk to consumers. Mm -hmm. And that way the supervisor gets the highest risk ones to start their jobs with, rather than sort of have to wade through mm -hmm. or do some kind of sample-based stuff. So I think there's a, because the space is quite safe, it also enables us to, I'm conscious of your comment about bad cop, um, it enables us to adopt a completely different approach um, whether it be thinking about forthcoming regulations. Mm. Um, so we now regulate claims management companies. Um, we didn't beforehand. Um, but again, that enabled us to have the conversation internally. How do we think about our approach from a digital, not an analogue perspective? Mm. 
And I think even just having that conversation is quite an advanced uh, well, quite advanced from where we were a few years ago. So. And this sounds like one of the, you know, when we have conversations about automation and that sort of thing, it's, this is the kind of automation that's making people more efficient. This yeah, is letting, it's augmented. It's, it's yeah, letting yeah. your people do more yeah. of what, you know, the high value thing yeah. that a human yeah. offers. It's and not, not replacing them. Right, right yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, I think one, one, one of the things that uh, also crossed us when we uh, trying to uh, introduce new regulation is what type of activities that we should regulate? I mean, there are uh, technology companies that offer solutions, but not necessarily offer financial services. And this gray areas, uh, and it created a debate even within our institutions, you know, where to stop? Because, you know, as I said, as uh, any regulators would like to put everything under their own auspices and under supervision because Anything that will create new risk within the system, we tend to jump in and try to uh, bring some order into it. So we, uh, in order to give more room for startups and new, new companies, you know, those who are offering purely technology solutions should not come under our supervision. Mm. We should allow this industry to, to work and develop and offer solution and not necessarily mm -hmm. come under our own supervision because okay. then you overburden them with reporting and supervision and oversight and all that stuff. Yeah. Maybe for some big institutions it might be part of their job, but for a small institution it, it becomes a hurdle on them in terms of costs, in terms of systems that they have to install, and of term resources. Yeah. So this thing, I think it's become clear on our mind that for some institutions, we are going to allow them to operate as long as they don't offer directly to the retail, the retail markets. Are there, are there any particular technologies that you as a regulator think are especially promising for, for regulation? Or, and this is really open to the entire panel. I think that Joanne may have some thoughts here. But uh, you know, are there any particular, whether that's machine learning or maybe something a little more granular than that, that you think is especially promising for helping, helping do your job? You mentioned earlier screen scraping, to, you know, but yeah. other things? Well, I mean, artificial intelligence is going to be a big thing for, for, the, for the financial industry. Banks are now moving very heavily into this area, and uh, this obviously will uh, give them uh, efficiencies in terms of costs, in terms of processing time, and, and uh, human, uh, human resources as well. So I think this is going to be one of the area that will uh, make a big transformation for the industry going forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's early stage. I think some banks have already started this. In Bahrain, uh, uh, we have uh, licensed two digital banks, which is completely you know, a new thing to our own environments. Uh, traditionally, you know, the, the, the conventional banks is where they have to have uh, uh, building and branches and all that physical requirements. So we took the decision two years ago to license completely digital banks. And um, the newest one, which will start soon, will apply artificial intelligence into their operations. Got it. Well, that's, that's interesting. And that, that kind of reminds me of a conversation I had with Joanne earlier. I mean, when I think of uh, big data usage, I think of big tech and that sort of thing. But are you seeing regulators use similar types of technology? We absolutely are. And in fact, I think ASIC in Australia was one of the pioneers of this. But the securities regulators in particular in the US and other countries have begun using big data to uh, scan the whole environment to look for signs of market misconduct that should then have a human uh, team uh, take a closer look at it. One of our regulatory agencies in the United States, I'm told, is the third largest user of uh, AWS data, Amazon Web Services data, other than uh, Google and Netflix, I think it is. Mm. And uh, so there's a tremendous transformation underway in getting the big data brought in. 
and using the artificial intelligence and machine learning. Mm -hmm. I think we have many challenging issues ahead on how to satisfy people with, about the accuracy and the fairness mm -hmm. of uh, these machine learning tools as to, because they become black boxes <coughs> where we can't fully explain exactly how they made the decision that they made. So we have a lot of work to do on that. The other one I want to mention quickly, and Gordon may speak about this more as well, is there's a lot of interest in whether new encryption technologies can enable us to share data much, much more widely. Mm -hmm. So the FCA is planning a, uh, a tech sprint, as they call it, in July, uh, a hackathon on any money laundering, and going to look at the question of can we use some of these, these new tools to protect data so securely that we would be able to share it widely among government agencies, even across countries and with industry, and still protect the identities of the people involved. Uh, homomorphic encryption and zero knowledge proof are a couple of areas that they're going to be looking at. It's exciting. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of, um, of uh, progress being made in the context that people are terrified that all of this data usage is going to harm us. If we have time, I'll tell a quick privacy joke. I saw a... Uh, There's always time for a privacy joke. Good. <laughs> They're my favorites. I saw a picture come into my uh, Twitter feed a while ago, and it was a picture of a little boy sitting at a computer, and Mark Zuckerberg was looking over his shoulder. And the boy is saying, my dad told me you're spying on us. And Mark Zuckerberg says, he's not your dad. <laughs> 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 so, you know, that's what we're worried about is all the data is, you know, we're not going to have control over it. So we yeah. have a lot of work ahead. Yeah. Got it. Well, you know, what are you seeing, what are you seeing in Australia, Chiwan? Um, I, I think first of all, I would like to get back to the government and just have a mention that as a regulator, we do not regulate red tech. But we are keenly interested in that area. I think the reason is very simple, because we do see the red tech have the potential to build culture compliant and be able to reduce time and cost in the compliant matter. And ultimately, we believe that would result in better consumer protection and outcome. So, um, in terms of using red tech, um, as I have mentioned before, ESSEC is keenly interested in this area. We are consumer of a red tech product ourselves. So um, we have um, done the natural language processing trial mm -hmm. in different areas. We are trying to use the new technology to see, for example, look at financial advice, product disclosure statements, um, and so on. Because from the um, from a regulator side, perhaps sometimes it's difficult for you to imagine you have a human being sitting behind a screen and actually <coughs> reading through pages and pages of a product disclosure statements. So we are looking at the opportunities of using the, um, um, natural language processing mm -hmm. to be able to uh, help us identify risk so that we can invest our human resource uh, in a more meaningful way. Like Gordon just mentioned, it's not replacing our analysts or our staff. It's more of a dedicated our resource to, um, to more value added um, process. And at the same time, um, very excitingly, we have got $6 million of funding from the government to promote red tech. Um, so that, as a part of our red tech initiative, uh, we are currently planning quite a few different initiatives as well. Um, we have put out tender to the industry and asking for solutions, for example, um, like chat box, be able to provide us um, um, a better guidance or process in terms of a licensing and also authorizations. We are also planning to have uh, problem solving events in the space of uh, uh, using automations in identify risk in financial promotion, financial advice, um, this area. We also have put out the tender for uh, looking at the use of uh, uh, voice analytic mm -hmm. um, to be able to monitor the sales of uh, life insurance calls. Um, so those are some of the areas that we have been focused on. And, but as I have mentioned just now, we see our role as promoter of the use of red tech. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Well, and, and Gordon, you've already mentioned a couple of cool technologies, the screen scraping to, to help with um, you know, identifying risk for, for consumers. And, um, you know, it was mentioned earlier, uh, Joanne mentioned encryption so that information could be shared more widely, mm -hmm. I think it was, so yep. that regulators can kind of just share more information and have a more perhaps holistic view of the market or a more holistic view of what's going on. Are there any others that, uh, any other technology that you find especially promising for regulators themselves? Or? Um, yeah, I, th I think it's not, not a technology, it's a combination of technologies. And so one of the things that we try and do is sort of, smash technologies together and either hope that something's going to result that's positive or just go, oh, okay, that didn't work quite the way we expected. Um, and so that's where the kind of um, sharing of information um, will help because, you know, anti-money laundering and financial crime is not a great, it's not a great facet of the financial services industry. So as colleagues from Essex say, you know, our role is to kind of convene and encourage the adoption. Mm. And so whilst people might be solving particular points or offering point solutions, being able to actually create something that enables an institution that's, I don't know, got 36 different company structures and 40 or 50 different countries, that's quite complex. So just seeing whether or not the technology is robust enough to achieve that kind of scale mm. is something that you know, we think we should have a role in trying to organise for. Whether it works or not mm. um, is a different question. The, the point, I think, is that it's a way of creating examples where we can point to types of technology and say, look, whilst we're not going to ever endorse a particular technology, we yeah. can understand that these sorts of technologies, so privacy-enhancing technologies, of which there are many types, in theory will help, and that enables us to um, encourage the firms to start adopting these technologies. Mm. Because like you, we do, we do think there's huge potential. Yep. Um, there's also some common problems across not only complex regulatory countries such as the US, with many actors, um, but just generally across the world. And so if we can point and kind of convene people around some of these challenges, mm. we can transform the industry, um, but also make it safer for everybody. Yep. Um, and, and Joanne's right, it's, it's, it's quite easy to get scared by, um, by data and, and the potential of it to be a force for good, and also a, a force that's perhaps not so good. So, you know, with 56, there seem to be 58,000 firms, we have to use um, more sophisticated ways of understanding where the systemic risks are, but also the individual firms are. Um, plus also, we, we want to deploy a chatbot so that people who ring us to say, well, how do I reset my password? That's a fairly standard question. We should be able to automate yeah. that. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it means that you can, and you can kind of... You're free to experiment, but there are problems that are known that you're experimenting on. And I think mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the area where there's enormous potential. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we are very fortunate. The UK has a fantastic fintech and regtech uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it has infrastructures that, that facilitate um, people sharing what they do, people joining what they do. Um, and certainly, if I think um, back a couple of years, we're now seeing the institutions come to us and say, if we were to run an experiment like this, would you observe? Or mm. would you kind of, would you help us? Yeah. And again, that's something that, you know, we've gradually had to seek, well, haven't always sought permission, but in theory, mm. um, we've kind of had to go through that organisational comfort about, yeah. but, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you're not going to do any more, you're not going to do any harm by mm. doing this. Mm. Um, there's a risk yeah. actually that <clears throat> might make things better. Mm. So I think just that flippant attitude or that slight change in attitude and, you know, there are a few people in this room who have um, been quite uh, forceful about um, us being able to have those conversations and a bit more vocally. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think it's uh, the, the range of things that are being de developed continues to be quite astonishing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we've talked about, you know, the really promising technologies and the, you know, and that's what I spend a lot of my time focused on is looking for like the cool next technology. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one that's been talked about a lot and some people would say hasn't materialized is, you know, will, will blockchain be making a difference in reg tech anytime soon? Do you think that blockchain will be used to make a difference in reg tech in, call it, the next 12 months, the next 48 months? Um, I'm open to the panel, but does anybody have any thoughts on that? You mentioned, I think, smart contracts. So it seems to me maybe you're a little bullish on, on blockchain. I am very bullish, very, very bullish on blockchain and distributed tech, ledger technology long term. <clears throat> a lot of people doing these projects are finding it's taking longer than they hope to get to something that's operational. So 12 months, I'm not sure. But the ability of the uh, technology to, to build into it 
a lot of the, the uh, trust factors that we now have to <coughs> provide externally around contracts mm. is incredibly powerful. A lot of people are working on blockchain technologies for identity mm -hmm. verification and know your customer. Um, you know, I, it, I think one of the reasons it's taking longer is it is a truly disruptive technology, more so than some of the others that we talk about. It's mm -hmm. breaking the mold. If we talk about cryptocurrency, I think uh, cryptocurrency is showing signs of maturing to a point where we've got, a, we've got markets in them that are stable. We've got the stable coin. Uh, is regulation the key to that too? The, you regulation know? is the key to it. The regu I, I think the, Not even the regulators tech, in the world key. have been in very different positions on this, but many of them have tried to not kill it in the cradle and let it develop a little bit, and of course that involves some risk. Right. Yeah. But then, uh, but have that now gotten to the point where we, we're starting to understand how to regulate it, how to protect people, and uh, th these are very, very, very powerful if I, ideas. If I may say, I think you know the biggest challenge for us as a regulator to this new. Uh, technology, you know, blockchain and crypto assets and so forth. I think, you know, how we make sure that there are no illicit activities going on, the AMM in particular, know your customers. I mean, still we are not yet uh, to the stage where we are very much confident. If we, if the... Um, crypto assets or crypto exchanges are going to offer their services and apply, let's say, uh, the capital markets rules, for instance, when it comes to know your customers and, and uh, the AML CFT requirements. I don't see how they will, at this stage, be able to offer the services with the same efficiency that they claim. Mm. On, the other, on the other hand, uh, how can they uh, give the assurance to the regulators that they are going to do all this yeah. due diligence and, mm -hmm. and uh, know your customers, especially that most of these activities are going online and sometimes outside the, the jurisdictions. Yeah. So there are um, some serious issues before the industry reaches a maturity stage. You know, there are also some incidents that recently took place which made it uh, a little bit, uh, I mean, alarming to the, uh, to the regulators, you know. How come this blockchain arrangements get hacked and at the same time uh, you cannot have trace, you know, how did this happen? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, unless you have all this in place, it will be very difficult to see this industry taking off easy. I know I've been talking in, in, in this morning with some uh, people about uh, how as a regulator dealing and their experience on dealing with regulating uh, crypto assets and crypto exchanges. And many regulators have as long as they are still small, not covering wide areas and big sector of the population, they are turning a blind eye, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually, these are things that are coming in the markets and happening and how to deal with it. And I think this is the biggest challenge for us as a regulator. And I think similarly in the future, regulators will face with this kind of uh, difficulty, you know, there will be new technologies coming that will uh, take over the traditional way of doing things, but the regulators will, will fall behind in terms of how to deal with them, how to deal, for instance, with systemic risk. Uh, if there is any financial crisis, how are you going to deal with it? Can I just say the I couldn't agree more. And the answer to that is we've got to get the regulators into a situation where they are using digital information that they can access 
analyze, mm. sort, share, compare. Mm. Re regulators are increasingly worried that they're going to have to try to regulate products they don't even understand and can't see in the old ways where they get periodic reports or they go into a bank and take a sampling of files. You know, we're going to have to enable them to be able to get a clear, real-time, full data vision into these most risky areas. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take some work, but I think it's happening. Got it. Well, I have a lot more questions, and I'd love to hear more privacy jokes, but I'm getting uh, the signal that our panel is over. But please uh, help me thank my fantastic panelists today.